I know Rose did. Rose, the stellar student. Yeah, Rose, how you doing? <laughs> we are not making our way through finals. We're ignoring finals. <laughs> yeah. It's Rebecca Garrison, and I am a community organizer with the Oahu Water Protectors and the Shutdown Red Hill Coalition. And perhaps most importantly, like all of you, I am a water drinker. So thank you very much for being here. We're so happy to share space with each of you at this emergency update with Mr. Erwin Kawata, Deputy Manager of the Board of Water Supply. Tonight's talk story takes the place of the Shutdown Red Hill Coalition's general meeting, which happens every other Tuesday from 5 to 6 p.m. If any individuals representing organizations here tonight would like to join the coalition, including the Board of Water Supply, just saying. Um, <laughs> we'd love for you to join our community of movers and shakers. Please email me at garrisonrs at gmail.com and I'll drop that address in the chat in just a second. Uh, before passing it over to Danny Espiritu, who will contextualize the urgency of tonight's meeting, I kindly ask that folks please raise their hands to ask questions or simply drop questions into the chat. The, shut, the Shutdown Red Hill Coalition Agenda Team will do our best to monitor those spaces. I would also like to plug this Saturday's, this Saturday's Walk for Why March beginning at 1 p.m. at Keehi Lagoon, and also plug the Hawaii People's Fund 50th anniversary celebration happening that same day and beginning at 5 p.m. So no worries if you show up late for the party after the march, we know folks will be hungry and thirsty. Um, so cruise through for free food, beers, live music, and of course, good cheer. Uh, one thing though, is that you do need to register for the event. Um, so uh, please do that. And we will also drop the flyer and more information about that momentarily. And as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. With that being said, I will now pass it over to Danny Spiritu, who will then pass it to Patty Choi to introduce Mr. Kawada. All right, thank you, Danny. Aloha mai kako. Uh, my name is Danny Spiritu. I grew up in Kaneohe and Kotlapoko Oahu. I'm currently living in Waimalu and the Moku of Eva. Uh, mahalo everyone for, for gathering together and mahalo um, Mr. Kawada for joining us today. Um, as many of us know, uh, the reason that we're here is because we love our vai, we love our island, uh, we love our community, uh, and we feel a kuleana, a, a responsibility, a, a privilege, um, and, and a burden in a sense to steward and, and to care well uh, for all of those things. Um, last week, Tuesday, uh, we, we witnessed the leak of over a thousand gallons of AFFF, um, PFAS car carcinogenic forever chemicals. Yeah, and just to kind of uh, speak to the, the severity of, of this, we're talking about um, 10 to 1,000, uh, 100,000 times more hazardous than, than jet fuel. Um, and the poisoning not only of, of uh, our current kiki uh, or kiki that will be born in our generation, um, but potentially kiki that none of us um, will even be able to see, right? Like we're talking about centuries um, from now and the impacts of that on, on the future. And so our, our hope in this, in this meeting is to get a little bit uh, more understanding about what AFFF and PFAS are um, and to kind of uh, use that as a base to inform our advocacy, especially in the, in the coming weeks. There are a number of uh, board meetings and, and public meetings uh, that will happen. And so hopefully uh, with some of the information today as well as the, uh, the webinar on Thursday, uh, we're, we're hoping to kind of uh, educate ourselves as a community to be able to really um, make, a, make a good push forward. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, Patty Choi and she'll introduce our speaker today. Okay, thank you, Danny. Um, per Irwin's request, when I asked him for a bio, he said, just give my name and my title. So introducing Irwin Kawata, Deputy Manager, Board of Water Supply. But I would like to thank Erwin and Ernie for coming out last Friday to stand with the community at the Department of Health for our sign waving. It means a lot to have people like you stand with the people. So please um, go ahead, Erwin. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Patty. And thank you, everyone. 
um, for uh, allowing me to be here and certainly for all the work that you're doing to um, uh, protect our uh, precious drinking water supplies. Uh, Ernie extends his apologies. He wanted to be here, uh, but he had another um, uh, engagement that uh, he had or a commitment that he had to go to. So I'm going to just um, share my screen here. And hopefully everyone can see that. There we go. Can everyone see that? All right. And then I'm just going to turn on my pointer here. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, Um, Department of Health to attend to explain us several things for us and uh, Erwin, I'm not sure if we're um, losing your audio. It looks like um, he's it's frozen. familiar with Can you see that? We Zoom can see quit it, but, unexpectedly. Um, we, I think you may have to start from the beginning because we uh, lost your audio. Actually, Patty, I think what's happening is he's freezing up. Yeah, he's freezing, right? Mr. Kowata, you turning off your camera, and, and that sometimes helps when this uh, freezing happens. Hmm. Yeah, see, I keep I keep getting this Zoom quit. Mr. Kowata, is there any way you can turn off your uh, video so you can give the, the presentation? We can still hear your audio. Also, can we ask everyone to turn off your videos at this time, please? That might help with the connection. Erwin, are you able to hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, okay. Your um, PowerPoint is on the screen. Oh, really? I can't even yeah. see it. Oh, you can't see it. Hmm. No. Okay, now it's gone unless you changed it. Okay, let me try to reshare that thing. And then would you be able to start from the beginning again? Because we sure. missed whatever was said. Sure. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good to that? go. We kindly ask everyone to turn off your videos while Mr. Kawata is presenting, please. And we should be good to go, Mr. Kawata. Okay. So can you see that? Is that okay? Yes. All right. Perfect. Sorry about that. Um, so um, let me start all over again. So um, when I got uh, the email from Patty, I think one of the questions has to do with um, our upcoming December 16th board meeting. And at that board meeting, uh, we asked EPA and Department of Health to talk about environmental action limits that they have set for total petroleum hydrocarbons, as well as the AFFF spill at Red Hill. And so Tonight, my focus will be on these two particular topics, give you the basis of why we're asking them to come and explain this to us, and some of the things about it that gives us concern. So this really kind of started uh, back in November 2017, and at that time, Department of Health had an existing environmental action limit 
for TPH at 160 parts per billion. And what they did was they changed it. They increased it to 400. And then what they also did was there's a, a threshold for taste and odor for the same TPH um, environmental action limit. And at that time, it was a, a 100 parts per billion, and they increased it to 500. Fast forward to this year, and this year, early part in February, they changed it again. They lowered it from 400 down to 211, and then they raised it a couple of months later back up to 266. And so our reason for inviting Department of Health is that we want them to explain why they did the change from 211 up to 266. But you know, more importantly, why go from something like 160 up to 400 and then back down to 211? So I just wanted to kind of give you some background, first of all, to kind of really kind of wrap your uh, arms around all of this. In 2016, when we first heard about Department of Health's environmental action limits, we did our own independent study to try to determine what would be considered a safe amount where the level would pose no unacceptable threat to human health or the environment. We had two different companies do this assessment for us, independent of one another. They didn't know each one was doing it. And those are the results that you see on the screen. One of them came out with 210. The other one came out to 160. And for the most, for the most part, on, for this kind of toxicology study, these two numbers here are, for the most part, pretty close. They are almost the same, exactly the same from a toxicology assessment point of view. Then what we did was we kind of compared what we got in our study and compared that to what department had in existence at that time back in 2016. They had a taste and odor threshold of 100, and they also had a drinking water toxicity of 160. We compared that to what other states had, Massachusetts and Minnesota both had the same kind of a value. So for the most part, if you look at all of these values, excluding the 100, just the TPH um, environmental action limit, they are for the most part pretty comparable. So at that time, we shared our results with Department of Health and we really told them that the most protective level is the lowest level, given that there's a lot of uncertainty with respect to TPH in drinking water. There's not much known about its health effects. And so you really wanna get to something, uh, to the lowest level that you can. Also too, this 100 parts per billion threshold for taste and odor means that's the level in which you can smell it. So for most people, Smelling something, even if it's good for you, people are going to think that it's not good for you because you can smell it. I mean, when was the last time you smelled something and thought it was good for you? So in that context, we said to Department of Health at that time, use 100 as your minimum cleanup level so that you can protect the groundwater from something that's not very well understood, which is TPH or total petroleum hydrocarbons, which is a, which is a mixture. Again, fast forward to 2017, right after that study was completed, they increased it to 400. The threshold for taste and odor, they increased it to 500. And in these two numbers are essentially saying it can be very smelly, but still good for you. And that intuitively doesn't make any sense. And then of course, in February of this year, they lowered it down to 211 and then raised it up to 266. Now, Bring that to the context of the testing that's done at the Navy housing. You know, after that incident in Thanksgiving of last year, there was a lot of work to try to flush that contamination out of the Navy's water system. And then beyond that, uh, Department of Health required the Navy to conduct regular testing on approximately 10% of the homes. That information is available at this website. And when you go to this website, you're going to see a map of all the different areas on Joint Base Port Harbor. And I just took one of them as an example. This is the test result for the Ali Amano Military Reservation. For samples that were collected um, in October. So here's the sun. These are different locations here. This is different locations on this at, at AMR. They took samples back in October. 
Some of them are dated back in um, July. You can see July here for some of them. And they analyzed them for a number of different contaminants. And all I did was just for the purposes of illustration here to try to you know, expand these numbers to be able to see them. I, we're looking at the total petroleum hydrocarbon level. Now here's the DOH screening level, the 266. This is the current, what DOH regards as safe. But in the samples, some of them they're getting over 100, 101. There are some houses that are showing less than that and some showing not detected at all. Now, if you think about where the water is currently coming from, the water is currently coming from that serving Joint Base Pearl Harbor. It's coming from Waiawa Shaft, the Navy's Waiawa Shaft. And that Waiawa Shaft is located in Pearl City Industrial Park. So if that shaft didn't get affected by the Joint Base Pearl Harbor you know, contamination that affected Red Hill Shaft, if that water is clean and unaffected by petroleum, then where do you think this contamination came from in the house? It had to have come from the pipes. And this pipe has been flushing since last year. So what this tells us is that number one, you can have varying concentrations coming out from the, from the pipe that petroleum is still within the pipelines or the plumbing of the house and as well as the Navy's water distribution system pipeline. And so when people are saying that they're observing odor of petroleum odor, get this kind of level here on, uh, of 100 and maybe even less than that, it's not inconceivable that that contamination could still be there, but give the notion, give the give people the concern that it's not safe because you can still smell something, especially when they had that um, the the reactions and the exposure to um, the the petroleum uh, and 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 during uh, Thanksgiving time. So that's why we're asking. Department of Health to kind of explain this to us. What is the basis of us then taking it down to 211 and then increasing it back up to 266? We're also asking them to explain to us what is the health advisory levels for, for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These chemicals can be found in petroleum uh, fuels because remember petroleum is a mixture of different kinds of hydrocarbons and PAHs or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are indicative of some of the heavier kinds of fuels. Now remember, this facility has been in operation for 80 years. And there is, through the contested case, we know that there have been at least over that time span, a number of leaks that occurred that amounts to approximately in the 180,000 gallons range in totality. Now, that facility has been operating from the 1940s to the present. From that time period to now, it not only held jet fuel, it held many of the other different kinds of fuels, some of the heavier bunker type of fuels, diesel fuels, there was gasoline in there, there was leaded gasoline. And if you think about all of those different kinds of fuels slowly leaking over that 80 year period, you're gonna have this very complex mixture of fuels that essentially is leaking out of the tanks, it's resting in the vadal zone of the rocks underneath the tanks and available for seepage into the groundwater. And the Navy's monitor wells within the Red Hill facility already shows detectable levels of petroleum hydrocarbons. So what that tells us is that the groundwater underneath the tanks is already contaminated and, and can move with that water to areas of the aquifer that is not contaminated. So understanding what these PAH levels and what is considered safe or health advisory level that's considered safe is, is equally important in addition to TPH as a whole. The other thing about this is that the PAHs has been detected in the, in the Navy's groundwater uh, wells. They have been detecting these kinds of PAHs for quite some time. And then thirdly, what we're asking uh, EPA and Department of Health is to explain to us or talk about the environmental and health impact of 
polyfluorinated alkyl substances or PFOS in that AFFF fire suppression spill that happened on the 29th of November. So let's talk about AFFF. Well, everyone knows what it stands for. It's aqueous film forming foam. It's essentially a foam that suffocates the fire. There are two types, class A and class B foams. Class A foams are designed for things like paper, wood, your normal household trash. It does the same kind of job. The foam comes as a concentrate. It, it's delivered, it's mixed with water. Air is pumped in there to create the foam and it is and it's essentially sprayed over the fire to suffocate that fire and deprive it of oxygen so it's, it's put out. Class B foams are designed for fuel fires. So, um, jet fuel, gasoline, those types of fires is designed for class B foams. And these are the foams that have PFAS in them. Now, PFAS really uh, was, uh, is, is really a mixture or various kinds of chemicals that were created back in the 1950s. And they were, manu they were designed to be um, on, used on nonstick products and to make um, garments and other surfaces stain and water resistant. You can also find them widely used on coatings, food packaging, you know, your pizza box, uh, that wrapper from that keeps your hamburger warm can have PFOS in those wrappers. And that it's something that's commonly found in firefighting foams used by the military as well as, you know, airports to fight oil and gasoline fires. Now, PFOS are water soluble, everyone knows, and it can seep into the surface and get into, you know, groundwater, surface water. And there's a number of studies that EPA has done already that uh, show that low levels of PFAS are being found in, in the environment as well as the wildlife. So let's take a look at PFAS, for example. And I'm going to teach you a little bit of chemistry here. The PFAS stands for per and polyfluorinated alkyl substance. Poly means many, OK? Fluoro means fluorine, and alkyl is the rest of the compound. Now, there are different types uh, of compounds that can have, you know, five, six, and eight carbons, like shown in this example here. Of course, per means that all of these uh, carbon atoms here have been, the hydrogen have been replaced by fluorine. So this, in this particular example, these two, PFOS and PFOA, these are the most common. They're the most common, they're the most prevalent, and they are eight carbons. You can count here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. It, in this case, it's a sulfonate. This is the sulfonate portion. And all of the carbons have fluorine atoms attached to it. This carbon fluorine bond is extremely strong, okay? It is difficult to break. And that's what makes this compound so so difficult to decompose, degrade, and it makes it so resilient to the fire because of the strength of this carbon fluorine bond. And so when you have this kind of a structure here, it also makes it very water soluble. So this alkyl portion here attached to these kinds of what is called um, um, other types of groups here, this makes the compound very water soluble. So chemically here, you can see that this is the reason why it is very persistent environment. It's difficult to break down, it's resilient, to the fire, it's so effective in, uh, as an ingredient in a foam to douse high temperature fires because of this chemical structure. Sorry. So that's why it can stay in the environment for a very long time because of that particular chemical quality and that it's known that at sufficiently elevated levels of certain PFAS, it can cause a variety of health effects, including 
developmental effects in the fetus, effects on the thyroid, liver, and other vital organs within the body. So that spill that happened um, of AFFF, what we know about it is the following, is that it currently, the estimate is about 1,300 gallons of AFFF that occurred at edit six, which is the lower part of the um, um, Red Hill facility. It actually leaked from an air relief valve after the pump pressurized the pipeline and it caused the, the AFFF foam to basically leak out of that valve and spray all over the all over the internal structure and it caused that liquid to start you know seeping out of edit number six throughout the lower access tunnel now right now as you all know there's a the, there's a investigation going on and you know a lot of this inflammation is is pretty much preliminary but for the most part um we have a situation here that how did this pump get turned on is still not known. How did the pump get activated if everything was off that caused the pressurization to essentially cause the AFFF foam concentrate to leak out of the air relief valve? So we are asking Department of Health and EPA to come to the board meeting to talk about this particular incident what they know about it to date, and certainly what is the impact on the environment and of course to the drinking water and to public health um, as to the PFAS getting into that environment from that AFFF foam. And with that, I'll take any kind of questions and that's pretty much why we're having that board meeting um, on the uh, 16th. December 16, which is next week, Monday. And I'll take any questions that you might have. Um, right on. Oh, yep, right. sorry. Thank Can you. I just interrupt? Um, Erwin, before we go into Q&A, could you explain why that board meeting is going to be so important and you know your request for testimony? Sorry, Becca. No, you're okay. Oh. And also real quick, Mr. Kawata, um, we have down that the meeting is actually Monday the 12th. Can you clarify? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the 12th. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about awesome. that. That's correct. Right on. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. <sighs> There's too much stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, we know. We know. <laughs> yeah. So um, why it's important is, is that number one, we're giving the, we, all of our board meetings are open to the public, number one. And so and the public has an opportunity to provide comments and ask questions. And um, this is, I think, the board's opportunity to ask EPA, as well as the public's opportunity to ask EPA and Department of Health directly questions about this particular incident, uh, the, the AFFF incident, as well as you know how they handle or how they measure uh, what's safe in the environment. Let's take the example of uh, TPH. When they change these values like this, um, we've been asking for quite some time now, what is the basis for these changes? What is the uh, information that we're using, they're using to come to these conclusions? We've looked at what they, uh, what they cite as their reasons. And um, I gotta tell you, it, it doesn't compute for us. And so this is gonna be another opportunity, especially for the most recent changes to be able to ask them uh, the questions. Right on, thank you so much, Mr. Kawata. Um, that was an extremely informative uh, presentation and we are all super thankful to you for taking the time to chat with us this evening, especially considering the request came in a bit late. Um, so no, no why, we, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Before we get into questions and answers, why don't we all give Mr. Kawata a virtual round of applause? Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I realize a lot of that stuff is meaty, so I tried to go as you know, quite, tried to go slow. It is a lot to take in, but um, tried to make try to explain it in a way that everyone can kind of understand it and not use too much scientific jargon. You know. No, it was really great. Thank you very much for breaking it down for us and for the chemistry lesson as well. 
Um, so we did have a, a number of questions that came in okay. ahead of the meeting. Um, so before I pass it over to Hanaloa and Malia, so nice to see you folks tonight. Um, I'll just ask this first question to kind of get us started. And then if folks have other questions, we kindly ask you to either put them in the chat or raise your hand. We do have a number of questions prepared, but we want to integrate folks live here as well. Um, so the first question is, might be loaded, but we want to know your answer. What do you think is the best way to defuel and decommission Red Hill? Start pumping the fuel out of there. Let's face it. Let's face it. This thing has been in operation before this, this defueling and before the incident happened. If they can move the fuel back then, they should be able to move the fuel now. Right? So... From our standpoint, we don't see any reason why they can't start pumping the fuel out today. No reason at all. I mean, the fuel, the facility was built um, in what, three years? Uh, they should be able to um, move that fuel very easily. I mean, they've asked, we've asked them before, how long does it take to empty out the tank? And they've told us in the past five days. So, um, and if the Navy can bring in all of those activated carbon units within the short period of time that they brought it in, we see no reason why they couldn't bring in, you know, additional tanks to, and containers to bring in to, to, to put the fuel in. Thank you so much for that honest answer. And I'm sure you'll get a lot of support from the community with that. Um, all right, with that, I'll pass it over to Hanalo and Malia. Hey, aloha kako. Uh, aloha, Erwin. Mahalo Hello. Louis, for your for your briefing. And uh, thanks again for uh, joining us uh, at our uh, sign holding on Friday. Really appreciate that. Thank you. That. Yeah. I just thought, you know, the one, I, there's a lot of good questions out there, I'm sure. And I just... What caught my mind was when you're describing that pump turning on and mm -hmm. they can't say how the pump turned on. Mm -hmm. It's making mm -hmm. me go back to May 6, 2021, mm -hmm. when yep. the sump pump turned on. And that's what brought the fuel up from that spill into mm -hmm. the AFFF return line. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is this possibly going to help shed some light on what happened on the 6th of May, if that's in fact what happened? We think it's all related. Um, you know, it's, I don't know how to say this, but it is, it's just amazing to us with respect to how, how the Navy operates this facility and the kinds of things that have been happening, given what has happened already. And, um, you know, the, 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 the it's just absolutely, I don't know, mind boggling to me, uh. I, I I just don't understand uh, how how all of this can happen and how the Navy doesn't really know how you know what's occurring within their facility to be able to uh, you know keep it operating properly. So you know I think from from our standpoint we think that everything is related. It's all about how this facility is operated, maintained, and it really. Um, it's really something that we need to get to the bottom of right away. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. Um, a kind of follow-up question from the first question in terms of what you think is the best way to defuel and decommission Red Hill. The follow-up question is, the Navy is unreliable and doesn't welcome community input. Should a third party take over this responsibility? If so, what third party? You know, there are lots of firms out there that specialize in operating and maintaining systems, and that would be one place to start. You know, it's almost like privatizing a particular operation. And so um, there are a lot of companies out there that operate fuel systems. Um, we used one firm in the contested case who specializes in um, understanding um, failures within fuel pipelines and fuel uh, transport systems. So um, in our mind, there are, there are firms um, out there that know how to operate these systems and uh, can do it 
much more efficiently and effectively than the way uh, it's being handled now. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, I see Mikey's hand is up. Mikey, you want to go ahead? Thanks, Becca. Hello, Arwen. Uh, hey, thank you I, so much for you know taking the time out of your day to sure. inform yeah. and educate us. It's it's always kind of a a refreshing um, <laughs> uh, contrast well. to uh, the, the Navy. <laughs> but um, I was wondering. I, I don't know if this is within your wheelhouse, but um, did you see the drone shots of the, um, yep. uh, the contamination zone? Right. You know, like right. that big white tarp um, right. that was placed over the areas that they said they had not um, excavated yet. Right. Um, like in your opinion, given like, you know, the, the Makahiki season, the heavy rains we've been getting, I mean, there was, there was rain the very night that that footage came out, right? Um, mm -hmm. In your opinion, do you think like NAVFAC has been doing enough uh, to kind of like um, ensure that the rain, you know, that's falling <laughs> um, on Kapukaki doesn't, uh, you know, accelerate um, the AFFF that's that's in like the concrete and the soil. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, once that thing uh, hit the ground, it's pretty much too late. Right. It's kind of like that, um, you know, you have a glass of milk and it tips over and it spills on your table. Once that happens and it starts moving, it's 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 going. So once that A triple F foam or concentrate hit the ground, it absorbed through the ground right away. And it's gonna start seeping right away. And the Halava Valley area is a pretty wet area. And so uh, there's already water in the soil and in the subsurface, and it's going to blend with that and it's gonna start moving downward. And so all the rain does is just give it additional push yeah, when it rains. So yeah, you can start slowing it down, but whatever you've lost is already gone. You can't retrieve it already. It's already in the subsurface, you know? Yeah. And Thank um, you. yeah. Thank you for that. That's terrifying. Yeah. Well, you know, you know I got to tell you, it is what it is. Um, and, you know, we've always felt that... Um, you know, we want to try to inform and educate the public as much as you uh, as we can, so that you can make your own decisions and choices about what you're hearing and about what you're reading. And you know, there's a I got to tell you, people are there's lots of smart people out there. Let me tell you. And so I think this is information that uh, you have a right to have and right to know. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Kawata. And, you know, I think it was pretty frustrating for folks to see the, the Navy's answer to the, the rains is putting down some simple tarps. So really appreciate you uh, sharing this information with us. Um, before I get to Matt, I see your hand up. We have another question that was submitted earlier. Uh, Mr. Kawata, how is the Board of Water Supply pressuring the congressional delegation to help get Red Hill defueled and decommissioned? Um, <clears throat> that's just something that we continue to um, call on them and ask them to uh, really you know, hold the Navy accountable. Um, we have our struggles. So I'll, I'll be very frank with you about that. Uh, we have our struggles. Uh, there are some congressional delegates that um, are asking the questions and there's others that are eerily silent. They're very silent. And uh, it, everybody knows this. Uh, I, I'm not talking about any kind of secret. Uh, but we continue to urge them, and um, when we do have their staff does come and want to meet with us and want to get our perspective, we do share with them at that time, you know, urging uh, their bosses to really hold the Navy accountable and get this thing moving quickly. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I, I noticed on the EPA's website, it said um, an action or a hazardous level was 70 parts per trillion for PFAS. And then um, in your presentation, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly, but I, I remember you were talking about parts per billion, which would be like a thousand times more, but um, I'm not sure if that was because it was total petroleum hydrocarbons. Right. Right. If, if you could talk some more about that to help clear that up, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, EPA um, 
set um, what is called interim health advisories for PFOA and PFOS, which are specific kinds of um, uh, PFOSes at uh, 70 nanograms per liter, and that's parts per trillion. Um, they have since adjusted those numbers, and they're still in the process of refining and, and coming to a decision as to what those final advisories are. And a lot of it is going to be based upon uh, re uh, testing that's required starting next year of all water utilities for uh, 29 different uh, PFOSs. Um, what I talked about in the presentation about uh, the parts per billion, that was for TPH. And so that was exclusively for TPH. Um, I think the jury's still out as to what the final health advisories are going to be for PFOS. But I can tell you it's going to be extremely low. It's going to be in the parts per trillion range. And compared that to a parts per billion, that's about a thousand times less. So, uh, and that's because it's so prevalent in the environment and, and it's, um, uh, it, has, it's, it, it has some very uh, concerns with respect to you know, health concerns. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. Um, Susan, I was just about to get the, to the question you sent in earlier, and that is, could you please share information from the meeting with stakeholders on November 18th? Also, has the next one been scheduled? Um, to my knowledge, the next one hasn't been scheduled. What was talked about on the first one was pretty much housekeeping. Um, they talked about what was already out there with respect to the defueling plan, what the role is of, you know, uh, Vice Admiral Wade, what his role is as the commander of the Joint Task Force, um, and what his focus is going to be, and how he re how he coordinates with or works with uh, other sectors of the Navy, which is Steve Barnett and Admiral Killian, which is the NAVFAC and then the the Navy Region side. It was primarily housekeeping. There wasn't anything in great detail about next steps or anything. I know Ernie um, is, and he continues to do this, uh, trying to get um, representation, uh, public representation on that um, information sharing forum. Yeah, thank you so much for advocating for the community and thank you for answering that question. Susan, your hand is still up. Did you have a follow-up question to your original question? She's muted. You're Hello, muted, Susan. Our friend Susan, who gives great testimonies. Yeah. <laughs> Susan, you're still muted. Okay, there... I'm muted. here. Oh, just give an old lady a break here. <laughs> yes, I am concerned about what um, guidelines that uh, Mr. Kawata can share with us if we are testifying on Monday, because um, the Department of Health has steadfastly not wanted to change the EALs to, mm -hmm. to separ, se uh, safer levels mm -hmm. because they have held that their calculations have resulted in their limits. Mm -hmm. And this has been consistent between uh, Joanne and Kathleen. And it seems like they will not waver. Mm -hmm. And so, and even comparing um, the EALs in your presentation to other states, it really, yes, it's good numbers, but no, it's not Hawaii. And I don't know how that would fit in. But can you give testifiers a way to kind of twist their wrist nicely? Well, all uh -oh. I can say is, is that um, we have advocated for uh, an EAL at the taste and odor threshold, which is 100, 100 right. uh, parts per billion. And certainly, you know, if you look at the data that I showed, uh, in the presentation about uh, what they were finding values less than 100. If you think about it, oh, yeah. you, you really got to get down to something like almost non-detect 
before it's really safe because conservatively, we don't know very much about uh, TPH. Um, we do know about the, the effects it's causing and the reactions that um, individuals who are exposed are experiencing. And given that and not knowing more about the, what the long-term impacts, you really want to get down to something like uh, a non-detect. But why Department of Health steadfastly takes that position that yes, at 266, it's, it's fine. Um, we're, str we're struggling to understand that ourselves. Yeah, because if it was us, it should be at least 100, not 266. It should be 100 because let's face it, at, if at 100 parts per billion, you can smell it. And you're going to still tell people because it's less than 266, it's safe. When was the last time you smelled something bad and thought it was okay? Right. Right. I mean, that just doesn't intuitively make any sense. Right. And just common sense. It doesn't. It doesn't. So from this I mean, particular, in this particular case, you know, it really should be something as low as you can get it. Thank you very so, much. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 don't interrupt you. Yeah, so I mean, back to the original question, how we can, you know, gently or nicely urge Department of Health. Um, I think uh, we should continue to, I mean, we're, we're doing the same thing. We're continuing to advocate to try to set the level at least 100 or below, number one, um, because of the uncertainty. Um, and certainly, you know, our voice is not being heard either, but we're, we're, we're putting it on paper. Um, we're bringing together our own toxicologists to, to um, um, write out the rationale and the scientific and technical reasons for doing it. And um, from our standpoint, it's just continuing to persist that way. Thank you very much, Erwin. Um, I will go ahead and pass it to Patty, your hand is up. Yeah, Erwin, could you tell the group what you told us before we officially started this presentation? Um, I had mentioned to you that people are really frightened about um, the fuel and the, mm -hmm. you know, gas and all that getting into pipes and what you think it's going to take to clean it up and whatnot. When, once, once the fuel gets into the pipes, um, I can't think of anything that you can use to clean the pipes out and still be acceptable, right? You're going to have to replace those pipes. And that's one of the reasons why we shut off Halaba Shan, because we don't want fuel contaminated water get into our water distribution system. And if you look at the data that I showed earlier of the Navy's water system, if the water that they're sending from Wyoba Shaft doesn't have any fuel and it's clean, then where did the fuel detections in those water samples from the house come from? It had to have come from the pipes. You know, just simply, it, it had to, either from the water distribution pipes or from the plumbing, the household plumbing pipes. But if you look at the other data too, some of them were non-detect and some of them had small detections. What that also tells you is that whatever fuel comes off of the pipe doesn't come off uh, evenly. It's it's sporadic. Some, that's why some people say that if you hear some of the reports, the people will say, I'm, sometimes I, I smell the fuel and sometimes I don't. That's because it's leaching off of the pipes in, an, in, an, in a non-homogeneous or uneven kind of way. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, people don't like to hear it. I mean, DOH doesn't like to hear this, but it is what it is. I mean, we're trying to... Um, draw conclusions based on what the data is telling us. Yeah. And that's what the data tells us. Thank you very much, Mr. Kawata. Um, before I, oh, Patty, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, I do. Sorry. Um, so Erwin, can you describe again to the group, you know, about changing all the pipes, how long it would take and whatnot? Oh yeah. So imagine, if, if let's say halava shaft was pumping and fuel got into halava shaft, halava shaft serves water from Moanalua all the way to Hawaii Kai. 
Now, if that entire length of pipeline and that network got contaminated, trying to replace all of that pipeline is going to take millions, maybe billions of dollars, number one. And it's going to take over 20 years to do. I mean, if you look at just our pipeline projects, we have pipeline where we're replacing old pipeline in the street. And it might be just two blocks long or three blocks long. And how long does that project take? It takes maybe a year to do, just to do two blocks. So it's not an easy task. And the other problem too is, is that, let me turn on the light here. There we go. So the other, the other problem too is when you dig up the road, you have existing infrastructure that you have to deal with, right? It's not something you can just go ahead and dig it and lay the pipe, right? There's other utilities in the road, you've got to get permits. It's a long process. So the idea of trying to replace all that at pipeline is just not feasible, period. Thank you, Go back Mr. to my example, right? Trying to take a cast iron skillet, saute your favorite vegetables in there, and then try to clean off all of that, you know, light, amount of oil in there with a Kleenex. You'll be there forever. I love these analogies, especially I remember the one you uh, brought up in terms of the spaghetti sauce and the plastic Tupperware container. Yeah. Uh, I still hear people using that a lot. So yeah. thank you very much for these food analogies too, because it, it definitely, you know, it, yeah. in addition to yeah. making us hungry, uh, creates an <laughs> image for us. <laughs> yeah. um, before I pass it over to Melody for her question, I wanted to ask this question, I think an important one that was sent in from an anonymous uh, person. Um, considering the many lies the Navy has been caught in this past year, through your experience at Board of Water Supply, what do you see the role of the community is in getting us out of this nightmare? The Navy continues to promise transparency, but all we get are closed conversations where only politicians are invited mm -hmm. to participate. We are beyond frustrated. The reality is, is that the nightmare, the nightmare has already happened. The groundwater is already contaminated, okay? You can't undo that already. So the only thing we can do is prevent more of it from happening, defuel that tanks. So the community can continue to press the Navy to defuel the tanks quickly, number one. Number two, press the regulatory agencies and of certainly um, getting the support from our congressional leaders to, to do the groundwater studies to understand the nature and extent of the contamination that's in the, in the, in the aquifer. Where is it traveling to? What other sources that it can potentially affect? And when it could affect it? That's the kind of thing we need to know, right? But the big thing is prevent more of it from getting into the environment. I mean, it's already exposed. We don't want any more exposure of contamination in the environment. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. I'll go ahead and pass it to Melody. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha, Hello. everyone. Hello, Melody. <laughs> Good to see you. And thank you so much for being here. I've got three questions. I'm going to go kind of quickly and and see if, uh, if you have the answers. Okay, you mentioned the, the EAL for the um, PFAS is at 70 parts per trillion pursuant to the EPA. Is there also an EAL by the DOH? No. Okay. And was it tested? Uh, do we know what the what it is? What What is the parts per trillion from that spill on Tuesday? No, we don't know. We don't know that. Okay. No, we don't know that. Okay, thank you. Then back to November a year ago when that fire suppression pipe was the one that the uh, fuel escaped from. Mm -hmm. uh, do we know whether there was any PFAS in that fire suppression pipe at that time? We don't know. We asked okay. them. That's one of the questions that we've asked. Okay, okay. And then looking at the permit, uh, let's see, dated December 17, 2021, giving uh, the Navy from the DOH the ability to, uh, what is that, to pump out the water and um, 
the testing permit, I don't see where it says that you have to test for PFAS. Yeah, that's so, one thing that we asked for. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last last question. Now back to this recent spill in Addict Six. Now I've read somewhere. I'm not quite sure where at this point, but that whole system, the fire suppression, was uh, built with PVC pipe. So it's totally inadequate, totally insufficient, totally illegal. Uh, and the Navy had decided, well, the cost to replace it to be steel instead of PVC uh, far outweighs, I, I guess, any type of risk of leaking like what has happened now. Do you know whether the spill at Added 6 is from PVC pipe? That part I don't know. But what I do know is okay. that system is part of a renovation that the Navy did back in 2019. So that pipe... The pump system is pretty much brand new. So for something that brand new to fail, um, we're asking a lot of questions as to why did it fail like that? Okay, well, if they're using substandard material, then the likelihood it's going to fail, I would think, right? And like I said, or it was, yeah, or, or it was put together in a way that it's substandard you know, workmanship and lack of maintenance and oversight okay. right and oversight do you have do you have the blueprints because i know even the navy no. they have a hard thing okay you don't even have the blueprint so you're not even sure where the piping is going whether that's the no. only pipe we've asked for that okay yeah Thank you. yeah ernie has already okay. asked for that and i'm not sure we're going to get it but you know we're, we we have asked for it okay can we get a copy of your slides sure Okay, great. Thank you. Thank I'll you. I'll send it to someone. I guess I'll send it to Patty or. Sounds uh, good. <laughs> environmental caucus. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, if you can send it to Patty and then we'll distribute it through. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, through yeah. Our, uh, our, our. By email. the way, everything on those slides is public information. We've presented it in the past, or you can find it online. It's public information. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Melody, for those quick, uh, rapid fire, but very important questions. And I think it's no surprise to us of the inadequacy of, of, uh, uh, the, the, of, the, of the military with respect to your questions. Um, why don't we go ahead and hear from Jolani Martinez. Please go ahead. Hi, Mr. Kawata. Um, one question. Uh, you mentioned that the AFFF leaked from an air relief valve after a pump pressurized pipeline used That's to right. distribute the AFFF. Can you kind of give us an analogy of that or explain like, what that means? Um, what that means is it's, it's almost like um, pumping water against a closed valve. The pressure is going to uh, get to a point where it exceeds what the, in this particular case, the air relief valve can hold, and then it's going to essentially burst and leak. And did you get a chance to see the video of the tarp um, in the area, the affected area uh, of last week? The one from the drone? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. What's your yeah. reaction to seeing that? Uh, too little, too late. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you, Jolani. Thank you for your excellent coverage in this issue. Really appreciate you. Um, okay, Marty, go ahead. Your hand is up. Hello, Marty. Hey, Erwin. It's nice to see you. Um, okay, so we, we've been through this, you and me, before, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I just I can't help um, noticing so many similarities between uh, what's been happening now since the, the league last year and what happened in 2014. And I guess I just want to hear from you if you think it's simply that the military doesn't want to move the fuel and they are just creating this theater to like draw things out and delay things um, because they just, for whatever reason, don't want to move it. Um, from, from my perspective, the answer is yeah. And then the Navy doesn't want to give up those tanks. They don't like the idea of this thing happening to them. Um, and they just want to do it the way they want to do it. Uh, and so um, 
all of this is being created to essentially, you know, extend the timeline out into the future. Simply put, I mean, like I said earlier, uh, the Navy used to move fuel out of that thing without even blinking. What's the difference between then and now? Nothing, absolutely nothing. They never did any of those improvements, all of the different improvements that they talked about um, to the pipelines, to the valves, to the monitoring systems that came on the report. And they wanna do all of those improvements. The reason why they wanna do, they need to do those improvements, I think is number one, the regulatory agencies is making them do it, number one. And number two, they're so deathly afraid of another leak happening. They wanna take every, the regulatory agencies wanna take every precaution to make sure that doesn't happen. But you have this AFFF thing going on. That kind of tells you there's some loose ends here. There's some gaps that still need to be closed. And maybe it's at a point where we need to have you know, a third party or non, a, a different you know, entity come in who knows how to operate these systems take over before something else happens. That's number one. The other thing that kind of tells me is, is that Maybe there are weaknesses within this whole facility that we don't know about that could come up, whether it's operated, physical, or the like. And that's something that's always in the back of my mind. Yeah. What kind of something lurking in the dark that's happening within this facility that we don't know about? And so part of that analysis to identify the improvements, I think, was done to try to identify any kind of skeletons that could be in the closet that's lurking within this facility, identify them and fix them so that another one of these incidents and that, that doesn't happen. But with the AAA, the AFFF incident happening, it, it sends a different message that maybe they're at, uh, they're, they, it needs to take a different path. I always you appreciate much. how straight shooting you are. No, Carmen. it is what it is. Like I, mean, I don't know how else to do this. I mean, Thank I don't you. know how else to say this. It is what it is. <laughs> and you tell sorry. it like it is. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and this is something that we told the Navy from very one, from day one. In 2014, when they had that leak, we told them, tell it like it is. I remember telling them, tell it like it is. Good, bad, or indifferent. Yes, the public's going to get upset. Yes, people are going to be uncomfortable with it. But if you get it out there, people can also understand the challenges you're dealing with. And maybe we can approach this in a very different kind of way. But, you know, they chose a different path. No, oh, thank you so much for that very honest and candid response, Mr. Kawata. Our friend Marty likes to call this not a modern marvel, but Frankenstein's monster. And I think you alluded to that very well. Marty, did you have a follow up question? Or are you good? All good? I'm good. Thank you. All right, right on. Why don't we go ahead and pass it over to Anne? Well, thank you again for being with us. Um, my question mm -hmm. is, do you have any clue how much, uh, how many of these fire suppression systems are on Pearl Harbor and Hickam? It seems like probably more than we would ever suspect because they should have one at every one of those aircraft hangars. They do. And, you know, all over the place. So finding out how much uh, of the foam stuff is there and where they store it until they pump it into places like Red Hill. Uh, so we'll, we can get a real feel of how much of this stuff is around. Plus um, the, and the, 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 my question also is, uh, um, do, you, do you have any hopes that uh, DOH and EPA will give us a verbal description of what they see on the video when uh, they are allowed to see it in the military facility? Um, well, I'll take the last question first. Um, number one, certainly if DOH sees it, we're gonna be asking them you know, what they saw. I think from a non-disclosure point of view, they may not be able to say, but I gotta tell you something, rather than hear from DOH, I'd rather see it myself. That's number one, the video myself, number one. Number two, respect to other PFAS systems. Uh, every, every facility that has aircraft or handles, you know, petroleum fuels 
have to have a fire suppression system in place for places like Honolulu International Airport, you know, Hickam, they got to have these, these systems. But in, let's say, at, at Honolulu International Airport, that location is over the Cap Rock. Any spill over there isn't going to affect the drinking water supply, not like where Red Hill is. So the places that I would be concerned about would be all of the facilities like that's, that manage few, large volumes of petroleum fuel, like at Red Hill, that's located above or over the drinking water aquifer. So places like Schofield, Wheeler, that have aircraft, uh, they're over the drinking water aquifer. Those would be the places that I would ask about whether they have AFFF. Uh, handling or that contain PFAS. The other thing about AFFF and Class B foams, you can actually get Class B AFFF foams without PFAS in it. Okay, they sell them. They do sell them. It doesn't contain any PFAS in it. So really, what should be happening is there should be a shift to using non-PFAS types of AFFF foams, especially if you're located over the drinking water aquifer, that will substantially reduce your risk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kawata. One quick follow-up to that question. Um, doesn't the, the Honolulu Fire Department already use a foam that does not contain PFAS? HFD does not use class B foams. They do use class A foams, but their class A foams does not contain any PFAS. I called Deputy De Deputy Chief and asked them, and they, they verified for us. So HFD uses only Class A foams, and it does not contain any PFAS. They do not use any Class B foams okay. at all. Thank you very much for clarifying that. So we know there is some on island, and I think there is precedent to turn all of these military bases into with the with the fire floating firefighting foam PFAS contaminant into mm -hmm. PFAS-free contaminants um, on a yeah, national- Yeah, because you're like, when you have a petroleum fire, trying to shoot it and, and extinguish it with water, that's in effect, yeah. You have to use something like, like a foam. Thank you very much. All right, folks, we are about five minutes out. So we're gonna need to wrap this up very quickly. I see that Gina and Patty have their hands up. So why don't we go ahead and um, we'll allow those last few questions, um, but we wanna respect um, you know, Mr. Kawata's time here today. Um, so I can, I can, I'll tell you what, I, I can stay a little longer to answer questions if you wanna stay, but I wanna try to get to, as many questions as I can get to. Okay, thank you. Well, that's really generous of you. Really appreciate that very much. Um, all right, uh, Gina, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to mention that in the movie Dark Waters, um, which is the community about the community that lives where um, the chemical plant that makes the PFAS and PFAS, um, what happened to their children, um, again, it's called Dark Waters, but at that time when the, their Department of Health tested, um, the Department of Health raised it by four times the EAL in that community. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching that movie and when it happened in 2016 in Hawaii, and I mean, in Halava, um, it was almost like a playbook, it happened the same way. The Department of Health raised it from 100 mm -hmm. to 400. And I, I used all of your documentation every time to testify about it. And finally, um, I just wanna say it was Roger Brewer, Brewer, and he's still there. And also Phoenix Grange, um, the two people can determine the this EAL for the TPHD, do you think that there's something wrong with that and that should be raised? So I went to go talk to Roger Burr, who is, I want you to know, ex-Navy. So he was able to understand a lot of like stuff, you know? And he, at that time in 2016, said that at Gina, he said, the oil, the fuel is, is organic. It's nothing compared to PFAS. And so now here we are with the PFAS and in your board of water bill with the new testing halava well, which 
my family drinks from has PFAS, trace PFAS in it, right? So I kind of want to ask, doesn't this mean that it's been happening for a while? And what do you think we should do? Should we ask for the accounting of all PFAS on Oahu and in Hawaii and find out how much is missing that's not accounted for? And do we need an, a leak inspector on behalf of us to check the Navy's systems? Thank you. Um. Yeah, thanks, Gina, for that question. I think, number one, with respect to PFAS, um, understanding how much of it uh, that is stored and used and exists over the uh, uh, drinking water aquifer, I think is important in terms of uh, AFFF foam. That's number one. Number two, uh, like I said earlier, there is a regulation where water utilities across the country have to do PFAS testing uh, required starting next year. Um, we actually did our own testing starting two years ago so that we can understand what's the impact to our drinking water sources. And out of that, we only found two sources that had right at the detection level, extremely low levels of, um, of PFAS in it. One of them is the Halaba wells, but Halaba wells, you know, is shut down. Yeah. But um, that was the only two sources that we actually found PFAS in them. And they are, like I said, right at that detection level, barely, we can barely see them. So we'll be doing the testing next year um, of all of our water sources. And um, we're going to make the, we'll make the test results uh, available online so that people can see the results. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. Uh, go ahead, Patty. Um, Erwin, two very quick questions. Will our home water filtration purification systems protect us when fuel hits our civilian lines? And number two, it's maddening to hear Ernie have to plead with the Department of Health publicly to share information with the Board of Water Supply. It's really pathetic. So with that said, are you aware of what the Board of Water Supply, I think the Department of Health has, um, what kind of plan they have once the fuel hits our lines because their mission and goal is to protect the public's health? Okay, so the first, the answer to your first question, will a home water treatment unit remove petroleum contamination from the tap water? No. It doesn't have the capacity. It doesn't have, basically it doesn't have the capacity and it doesn't have the right kind of treatment system in it to, to, to be able to do it, number one. Number two, respect to the second question, what would Department of Health tell us uh, in, in the event, um, you know, our water became contaminated with petroleum contamination? Watch what's happening with the Navy. They're just making the Navy doing a lot of testing. And basically the, the task of cleaning up the water goes back to the water utility. And historically, that's how the regulations are designed. The responsibility for compliance with the rules and compliance with any kind of regulatory order rests with the water utility. So it would be on us, okay? So that's why I'm doing a treatment study right now. I'm, try, I'm doing a treatment study to understand what it would take to remove petroleum contamination and PFAS removal from the drinking water as a function of amount. Because when you've got all that 100 million gallons of petroleum that's still sitting over there, what if there was a lot that was released into the environment? What would it take to remove that quantity of petroleum from the water? And I'm going to tell you right now, there's going to be, everything has a limit. There is no treatment system that can take out everything. I mean, at some point, it's going to exceed the treatment ability, system's ability to remove. And at that point, it becomes cost prohibitive and technologically infeasible to remove that contamination. So. You don't want to get there, right? You don't want that kind of situation. I'm talking about, I mean, what? They had 19, look what 19,000 gallons did, all right? In terms of what it did to Red Hill Shaft. That's 19,000 gallons. Multiply that by 10. 
190,000 gallons. Just imagine what that would what that would do to the water. Now multiply that by another 10 or 1,000. What would a million gallons do to the water? It could render that water uh, to the point where you can't clean it up. So the thing that you have to think about here is the incident itself. Yes, it's 19,000 gallons. That sounds like a lot, but look what it did in terms of in relation to how much fuel is there. There's 100 million, 100 million gallons approximately stored in that you know, uh, facility. Look what 19,000 gallons did to Red Hill Shaft. And they're still trying to clean that thing up. So the best advice, don't be there. Get rid of that thing. Don't let it get there. But whatever got there, it's too late already. Now, do we have hope? There's always hope. Get rid of that fuel so that not much more of it can get in there. But if we have a, we have a situation that we're taking our sweet time, all we're doing is just basically, you know, rolling the dice. Yeah. And that's not a smart way to do things, period. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. Um, Patty, did you have a follow-up question? Because I know you had sent in a number of questions ahead of time. You know what? I'm hogging the stage, so let Dave go. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Dave. Thanks, Patty. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> you can hog. <laughs> um, just, just that uh, I used to be very much involved in the anti-nuclear movement. And every time we're getting close to shutting down a nuclear power plant, because of the amount of radiation in the area uh, was reaching a critical level, they would go and change the level of, of what contaminate was considered to be unsafe. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is what basically what the Department of Health is doing. Yeah, so it's getting to the is. point where, yeah, it's getting to the point where, uh oh, we are legally, you know, uh, going to be in trouble here. So we'll just have to change the criteria, putting us at greater risk, but kind of covering their butts. And so uh, that's that's what's really going on. And that's I, the I don't think, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and that leads to what I don't have a question. I just want, you know, the every politician let us down. Every one of them, Department of Health has let us down. And the only folks who've been stood up for us has been you and 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 er, Ernie and the entire Board of Water Supply. And uh, I just, you know, all of us, we're just so grateful that you are doing what you were, you know, <laughs> hired to do. And what you, you, you're doing your job to protect the community and protect our water. And the gratitude that we actually have honest folks like you, without you, that, that would be it. We would all be drinking contaminated water and that would, without you, you are the only stopgap we have. And I just really appreciate you so much. And I hope everyone here does. And I just wanted to thank you personally for uh, having the courage because it does, because they put a lot of pressure on you guys not yeah. to do the right thing. And and that's hard because most people crumble. They just go along. And you you haven't done that. And I just appreciate your bravery and your sincerity and, and for looking up for all of us. Thank you. Nothing, no, thank you. I mean, um... I don't know, Ernie and I was talking about this. We talk about it all the time. And uh, doing the right thing oftentimes is uncomfortable, right? And that's why people have, there are folks that have uh, trouble trying to figure out what is the right thing and actually doing that right thing. And uh, certainly sometimes you have to um, um, have some courage to do that right thing too. But the, the point here is at, at the end of the day, we're talking about a resource. And uh, we got this resource that was very pristine. And it's our duty to make sure we hand it off to the next generation in a condition that's better than what we got it. And if we don't do that, um, we're, not, we're, we're doing a disservice to the future because they're going to deal with problems that are much more complex that we can even imagine what it's gonna be in terms of complexity. And they have to have every possible resource at, this, at their disposal to deal with those particular problems. And so um, Ernie and I talked about this uh, a lot. We talk about this stuff a lot. Uh, it's, it's our duty to do this. And if, and if we can't, then we ought to pack up, go home, right? Yeah, thank you. I, I, think, it, I think it 
it always is the hard thing to do the right thing. And and uh, some people just don't have the ability to do it. And, and you folks do. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Dave. And thank you, Erwin. And also, Ernie, we love you folks so much. You know, we appreciate so much you, you didn't sign the NDA like some other departments did. And, mm -hmm. you know, that also takes courage. Thank you again. Um, so before I pass it to Jolani for her next question, I just want to make sure Lacey's question gets answered. We've been doing a lot of really important, um, you know, organ organizing with affected families. And Lacey has come out to so many different events and just really poured her heart out at different oral uh, for different oral testimonies um so this is coming from an affected family member mr kawata um lacy asks i want to know what the levels were on ford island on november 6 2021 i could smell and taste it at that point it was also the first day we moved here and it was high enough to make my three-year-old vomit for nearly a month straight that to me is enough proof that the eal's are too high and there's like five exclamation marks after that either that or the navy was lying about how high the levels were or when the large leak actually started do you have any comments for any of that that question okay number one uh, at the time of november of last year when people saw you know the the the, the contamination floating in the water the amount of contamination at that time, uh, as far as we know, we don't know whether or not it was tested. Um, that's something that we're trying to ask department. We're asking Department of Health whether it was tested, and we're not getting a straight answer. But as far as the amount is concerned, um, it was pretty high, and it I I wouldn't be surprised if it was it exceeded the EAL. Okay, in terms of TPH and and any other kind of chemical that could be inside of that mixture, I wouldn't be surprised. So um, that that worries me a lot, right? So what happened la last year is that there was an, a sudden acute uh, exposure of all of those residents who was on Joint Base Pearl Harbor that was exposed to that water. And what they are experiencing is uh, essentially the effects of that acute exposure. And trying to understand the implications of that exposure, I think is something that the, the CDC and the ATS, the ARCH is trying to do. Um, but without that data, and I think they're trying to, and they're trying to see if the data is there, but without the data, it's really hard to quantify the, the extent. I mean, I'm not a medical doctor, uh, I'm not a toxicologist, but I'm just looking at it purely from a chemistry point of view. Uh, if you can see the contamination floating in the water from an amount in the water standpoint, it had to be higher than what the EALs were. And Thank certainly you. only testing is going to validate that, but that's just from uh, my vantage point. Thank you, Mr. Kwata. Um, Lacey, did you have a follow-up question? Oh, yes. I just wanted to clarify that uh, I was referring to before the acute spill. This was before, like in the beginning of November, before they said the acute spill. And I couldn't see it at that time. Well, I wasn't looking for it, but I could smell it. it smelled like faint kerosene. Yeah. And I could just taste that it was off. So I don't know, no, I didn't see the sheen at that point. Well, there was data. There was data that of samples that was collected in July of 2021, and it was in the neighborhood of about 500 uh, parts per billion TPH diesel. Um, there is a water quality report that the Navy put out for uh, year 2021 that had, that showed 500 parts per billion or 460 parts per billion in um, uh, Red Hill Shaft. So 460 and 500 is higher than 400, if 400 is the EAL. So the answer to your question is, yes, there is data out there that there were times that the value was higher than the EAL. 
And I just wanted to make one other comment. I'm a veteran and I've seen a triple F so many times as somebody who's been on three deployments on an aircraft carrier. I know what it looks like. Um, and I have suspected that it was in our water on Hickam. I've suspected that for a long time. Obviously we have no proof, but um, you know, Mikey's been to my house, he's smelled my water and he can tell you, you know, there's just more to the story. So when you say you're investigating and wanting to know what exactly was in Red Hill, there's no doubt in my mind that there was more than jet fuel because I, as a service member, I know what jet fuel smells like and I know what AFFS, I know, and I know that it was more than that. So I just thank you for continuing to look into it and thank you for everything you've done. Yeah, no, no, thank you. I mean, um, that's something that we've asked for. I mean, as far as what you're saying, it is scientifically plausible that there were other contaminants in the water, including, you know, PFAS and potentially other chemicals in the water when they were recording TPH at, you know, 400 or 500 uh, uh, parts per billion. Because remember, TPH is a mixture, right? Thank you, Mr. Kawata, and thank you, Lacey. Um, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and pass it to Jelani. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Kawata, um, have you seen the spill video? Um, and has it been released to you? And what's your reaction that the military has not publicly released it? You mean the AFFF spill video? Yes, yes. yes no, we, we haven't seen it. And what, how do you feel, you know, the military keeping it from being released to the public. We're very disappointed, number one. It's not in keeping with the Navy's continual call for better transparency and more um, um, public disp disclosure of information. Um, and you know, the information about the AFFF leaking from an air relief valve, um, mm -hmm. does that change the Board of Water Supplies investigation at all? Uh, change our investigation, it doesn't, it, it uh, actually heightens our need for more information as to what happened, how much was released, and what's uh, how much uh, PFAS is in the soil and in the groundwater. And is it common for these types of valves or pipes to break? No, it's not common. We have air relief valves in our system too, and they're designed to let air out but keep the liquid in. Okay, so if you operate your system correctly, air relief valves essentially um, reduce pipeline pressure so that the pipe doesn't, you know, overpressurize and break. That's what air relief valves does, but it's designed to keep the water in, but only let the air out. So in this particular case, you know, what we suspect is at that point where the air relief valve failed, it not only failed the device itself, but the connection to the pipeline failed too in order for the air and the liquid to come out. Sure. And then uh, just to clarify, those pipes related to the AFFF spill, you, those were the ones you said was part of a renovation in 2019, correct? That's our understanding. It was renovated back in 2019. Okay. Thank you so much. That's all the questions I have. Yeah, thanks. Right on. Thank you very much, Jelani. Um, before I pass it to Mikey, Mr. Kawata, how are we doing? Keep going. All right, right on. We love you. Thank you. All right, Mikey. Thanks so ahead. much, Lauren. <laughs> Just let us know oh, if yeah. you need a break or whatever. <laughs> okay, so so speaking to that uh that last question, um, you know how like uh they're saying now that they have to halt operations because their uh, you know, uh, fire suppression system isn't working. Well, clearly it wasn't working the entire time they were defueling. So do you think there's any convincing reason to why they should stop defueling the defueling process now, given that it was never working in the first place? Um, my answer to that would be, um, number one, they should make sure they have some kind of safety system in place to be able to handle any kind of emergency, right? especially any kind of uh, a fire or other kind of uh, incident that happens. So if you're gonna continue operating, um, I think the answer would be yes, provided you have uh, systems in place to be able to address any emergencies that occur. 
Thanks. And um, Lacey kind of answered the first part of this question, which is like, does a a triple F have like a distinctive additive or or odor that it gives off? So I guess I'll just ask Lacey later. Um, but um, do you, as far as you know, is there also like, um, do we know kind of like the level of viscosity of a triple F in uh, like pipeline materials? You know, the, uh, like, do we know anything about how uh, much they cling to a pipeline as compared to to TPHD? Um, in particular, the, the the only thing that we know is the uh, the A triple F uh, concentrate that was used here is a three percent solution, and it's made by uh, uh, Ansel A N S U L. You can go online and find it. If you look for the Ansel three percent concentrate, it is a C six PFOS form, and it's the one used for. Um, military spec specifications. Uh, that is the, it's what we were told, the uh, product that was released. So it's a 3% concentrate solution. Ansel, A-N-S-U-L, Ansolite is the actual product name, A-N-S-U-L-I-T-E, Ansolite. And you can find it online. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. Thank um, you. Before um, I pass it over to Matt, I just wanted to give Jamie Simic a uh, the, the opportunity to ask a question, uh, another one of our affected family members we've been organizing with. Thank you so much, Jamie, for all of your courage. And go ahead. Hi, thank you. I just first wanted to thank you, Ernie Lau, the Oahu Water Protectors, Lacey, everybody that speaks up and advocates, seeing how far everybody's gotten and even though we're still lacking a lot of transparency, um, more answers are coming out than I ever thought we would fully see. Uh, my question is with the lack of transparency that we're still receiving or the island is still receiving, um, have there been thought to increasing the um, testing at the water well sites instead of um, the frequency it was at, <clears throat> upping it, because we're apparently still having leaks and spills. And then has there been any frequency in testing of the ground soil surrounding the aquifer? Yeah, after the, after the AFFF incident happened, we did send a letter to EPA and the um, uh, Department of Health uh, demanding that they require the Navy to do weekly testing of the groundwater uh, and the soil for uh, uh, PFOS um, in the in the vicinity of Red Hills uh, added number six as far as the soil and certainly all of the groundwater monitoring wells. The Navy has approximately 20 monitoring wells uh, on their property. Test them all for, for PFOS. And then make the, you know, send us the, the results and make the uh, results uh, publicly available. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. Um, go ahead, Matt. Thank you again. Um, so earlier we talked about um, that PFAS was uh, 70 parts per trillion at an action level and the petroleum was 100 parts per billion or 200 parts per billion. Um, well, the taste and order, right? Yeah. Um, it, it sort of seems like uh, PFAS is about a thousand times or over a thousand times more dangerous to our health. Yeah, right. that's the reason. So when I first saw that, I was like, oh, we leaked out uh, over a thousand gallons, a thousand times a thousand, that's equivalent of spilling a million gallons. But then Mikey's question, I think um, you said it's 3% concentrate. So would it be more, would it be more like the equivalent of 30,000 gallons for every thousand gallons of PFAS? Uh, by volume, yeah, I would say that's correct. Yeah, so I would I, say that in order for us correct. to give testimony, like, can we say this is the equivalent of them spilling thirty thousand gallons of fuel over the aquifer, or, or a thousand times, whatever? Um. Yeah, I guess if you do the math and you do the math and you do it by volume, I think uh, that's a good approximation. I would say, yeah. Um, one of the things you got to kind of uh, kind of keep in mind, though, is that uh, 
Uh, TPH, again, is a mixture of different kinds of hydrocarbons and your, your, um, the, the, the weight per unit volume of that is going to be different than uh, AFFF, which has, for the most part, primarily surfactants and uh, PFOS in it. But I think in general, I think that's a good approximation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. All right, before I pass it to Gina, we have one question that came in from Natalie Segovia doing really important legal work on the continent. Um, the question is, has there been any request from Board of Water Supply to Josh Green regarding attention to this matter? I saw that water protectors were turned away from holding signs. Yeah, we heard about that too. That's uh, unfortunate. Um, the, the, we have been in touch with, you know, the uh, governor Green when he was in the legislature and when he was lieutenant governor. Um, so our, our our plan is to continue to do that and uh, try to seek a, a meeting with him to kind of continue to express our concerns about, um, you know, the entire Red Hill situation, both the PFAS and, and the um, uh, the petroleum fuel that's stored there and any other kind of chemical, you know, that, that could be there. Thank you very much. Um, go ahead, Gina. I wanted to ask, um, since the reality is the Navy is probably not going to come up with indigenous microorganism solution for the water going into the future for the next seven generations or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be a good idea for Hawaii to have its own testing program on the effectiveness of the latest indigenous microbe research, which is being targeted at PFAS? There's, they have a 30% success rate, but they are good with the fuel. You know what I mean? Um, it's yeah. come a long way over the last 10 years, yeah. but can is there a way to, do you think, negotiate to get that paid for so that we do it? I mean, because, I mean, of course, it would be great if the Navy did it, but at the rate things are going, they don't even know if there's a leak. You know, they can't mm -hmm. even explain what happened last year mm -hmm. with the AFF line and all that. I've never seen a blow by blow from them. Usually when there's an accident, there's a second by second, minute by minute blow for this kind of thing that I've never seen that. I don't think they really know what went on, to be honest. Well, you know, as far as, you know, research, um, research is always a good thing because it's about knowledge and it's about learning. So, you know, one place probably to kind of check into would be um, talk to Water Resources Research Center over at University of Hawaii. Um, talk to um, uh, Aurora Viviani. Um, they may be interested in, in starting up a research project to look at effectiveness of microbes and um, its uh, degradate use as degradation uh, on petroleum contaminated environments. Yeah. But I mean um, to say, shouldn't we fold this into the general overall bill that we're going to be giving the Navy? you know, like for the additional wells that you need to make for mm -hmm. the additional testing, can it be folded in the uh, a budget for remediation? Because they think remediation is something else. They don't think about cleaning the water as remediation. Yeah. They think of pumping and dumping halava as remediation. Yeah. No, I, I, I think um, all of those things are possible. And um, everything associated with environmental clean, cleaning up of the environment and addressing the, the situation is something as far as we're concerned, we are seriously looking at it and we're keeping track of all the costs associated with our action and response to what's happening. And certainly um, cost recovery is, is within the realm of, um, it's on our radar with respect to uh, where we wanna go into the future. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, our ratepayers shouldn't have to shoulder the burden for all of this stuff. I feel like we should submit, submit an estimate for what it would cost for such a program. 
if that's okay. Um, if I mean, to from the Hawaii side, I'd like to. You mean, you mean like doing a like a microbial research? Yeah, I think that should be part of the request, the ask, because the sure, EPA is the EPA is not going to do it. Mm -hmm. The EPA, um, no way they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I asked them so many times about it. They don't even know, you know, they only stuck on aerobic or this kind of, they have all these excuses, but the reality is nobody else is going to do it ex unless you live here. I think they're not yeah. really that interested. Yeah. Well, you got to have, I mean, we, we got to have a, a facility and an entity that knows how to do research for one thing. Yeah. This type of research. Uh, asking is one thing, but mapping it out and describing how to do it is going mm -hmm. to be needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think it's great. Thanks. I will propose it also to APEC, to Asia, because everybody has the same problem. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. All right, so we're going to wrap up with just two more questions. Uh, we have one that was submitted earlier and then also from Patty. Patty, did you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, okay. Erwin, uh, what is mm -hmm. what does the Board of Water Supply believe is the best way to defuel the tanks? Turn the pump on and open the valve and get the fuel <laughs> out of that pipeline and put it in a storage container and start moving it. Yeah. But do you believe um, that all these fixes that they claim is uh, will take two years is, you know. Well, that's what I mean. That's what I said earlier. Yeah, that's what I talked about earlier is that the facility was operating all this time without those fixes. And so I think the reason why those fixes were identified is because the Navy and especially the regulatory agencies are so afraid of any, any further releases that they want to make sure that the system is tight enough or robust enough to be able to move the fuel without any more leaks. Because, you know, we've heard anecdotal and secondary stories that when the Navy was operating this facility, that there were leaks occurring all the time. And, you know, we don't doubt that but we don't really have any kind of documentation to prove that either. So I think the reason why those so-called repairs are in there is that there's tremendous concern about additional releases from movement of the fuel. Yeah. But you gotta weigh that with respect to the risk of that fuel sitting where it is. If you're gonna spend two years to try to make all those fixes, you're accepting the risk of two years of that stuff sitting there, right? And you gotta weigh that against moving that fuel today and trying to reduce that risk. So from our standpoint, look at the tanks that are in the best conditions, move it through the pipelines, that section of the pipeline that's in the best condition and start at least reducing some of that risk instead of sitting around wondering what I'm going to fix, hiring somebody to fix it and fixing it and still have all that stuff sitting there. Yeah, it's about weighing all of these risks. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and then Doesn't that one make last, sense? Yeah, no, totally. One last question, and maybe it can guide us for the testimony for uh, your board meeting. Mm -hmm. The EPA is going to be there, Department of Health. I'm a little confused on what our testimony should consist of. Well, I think there are several things that public testimony should continue to drive at. Number one, test um, transparency and opportunities for public participation, number one. Number two, get that fuel out of there. Minimize the risk to the aquifer. And number three, investigate the cause of that AFFF release and make it publicly known and make some decisions about where we're going. Maybe something's not working as well as it, it should be and be very, very frank about it. Let the data drive your conclusions, right? Let the data, look at the data, let that data 
drive your conclusions and make some decisions from there because maybe what's happening is not working as well as it should be. And maybe the regulatory agencies don't want to look at it that way, but you're going to have to start looking at it very realistically, right? But the need for transparency, the need for public participation, and get that fuel out of there and minimize the risk to the aquifer number. And then lastly, do the study to understand the nature and extent of the damage to the aquifer and the environment. We need to know what that is, because if there are other wells out there that are at risk, we need to know where that is, where that is, and what the extent is. Because otherwise, something's going to bite us in the dark when we're not looking, and then we're going to find out, and it's too late. Yeah. Thank you very much, Patty, for that question, and thank you, Erwin, for the answer. Uh, before I pass it back to Wayne for closing remarks, there's just one last question that was sent in early earlier by mm -hmm. Mr. Gary Hoover. Uh, it is a provocative and a very important question that I think that we would all be interested in hearing um, from you about. Um, the question is, what is your opinion on advocating for a smaller presence of the US military on Oahu and in Hawaii? The larger size of military presence in Hawaii the more need they will have to store fuel and related materials, such as the AFFF chemicals. This is dangerous, but particularly dangerous for islands in the middle of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Isn't Hawaii being made into an environmental sacrifice zone without any chance for the people who live on Hawaii to have a voice in the matter? I think this is coming from concern and thinking about how islands are often used as buffer zones for mm -hmm. a continental safety. Mm -hmm. um... No doubt about it. We have lots of um, examples where we have environmental pollution as a result of um, the, the military's um, presence here in the islands. And that's a, that's a reality. And the, the military at the end of the day needs to be able to demonstrate that they can um, um, care for the environment that they're in instead of just doing what they're doing and thinking it's okay. Um, and it's a new day. We have to realize that this environment is fragile. It's not going to stay clean unless we do keep it clean. It, it's just a reality. So yes, I think there needs to be a certain amount of military presence because we're here in the middle of the Pacific and there's a certain strategic importance with respect to Hawaii and the rest of the world. Uh, but if the military can't demonstrate that they can stay here in a way that keeps the environment uh, clean and preserve that environment, then you better lower your expectations until you reach a point where you can prove that you can be here at, at the size and scope that you want to be here and still keep the environment uh, clean and pristine. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. Mr. Hoover, did you have a follow-up question? No, I thought that was a great answer. I think we could go on and on about the whole, the sort of the detailed aspects of that, but I, I, I appreciate the answer very much. Thank you, Mr. Kawata. And thank you, Mr. Hoover, for sending in that question. I think a lot of us have been wanting to ask that for a while now. Um, all right, with that being said, I just wanna thank you so much, Mr. Erwin Kawata for spending so much time with us. Sure, thank we you. really appreciate you taking the time to be here um, and just so much love for you, Mr. Ernie Lau, all of Board of Water Supply staff administration for you know just coming out and advocating on behalf of the community. You're truly like the only folks we trust at this point. Um, besides, of course, our our superhero Wayne Tanaka as well. Um, so, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I mean, if you want to do this again, let us know. I'll be happy, you know, to sit and answer questions and like that. You know, and maybe next time, you know, plan for a couple of hours or two and a half hours or something like <laughs> that. <laughs> Sounds good. That's awesome. Thank you very much. And um, with that, I'll go ahead and pass it to Wayne for the okay. closing remarks. Well, thank you. I just want to say thank you again so much, Erin, for joining us and, and, and to everyone um, to, who, who came here to, to get a better understanding of what, what we've been going through. Um, you know, this is, I mean, you all know what we've been dealing with, for, you know, for the last eight years, 
and really for much longer. You know, you know, we've been lied to. We've been our concerns have been dismissed. We've been treated as expendable and 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 more gullible than we've been treated as like we're stupid and that our lives don't matter. Um, and you, you know the people that were poisoned acutely, they're, they're still sick, they're crying for help to deaf ears. And, and you know that there's 104 million gallons of fuel still in Kapukaki that could force us here today to witness the end of a source of life that has provided for this island for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and now we're in a whole new ball game. You, know, you, you heard you know, Ern's chemistry lessons. These chemicals are orders of magnitude you know, at parts per trillion, parts per quadrillion, you know, these chemicals are thousands, maybe tens of thousands of times more toxic than jet fuel. And they don't go away, which means that this isn't an issue for our generation. It's not even an issue just for our children or grandchildren's generation. This is something that could poison children, poison people who will be born after we are gone, after we are ancestors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And, and the Navy knew this, and they knew how toxic these chemicals are. They knew this facility was 100 feet above our groundwater aquifer, our drinking mm -hmm. water. And they knew that there are alternative non-PFAS foams, and they still chose to keep this PFAS, uh, this AFFF containing PFAS in Kapukaki. And so, you know, I don't want to wait until I'm an old timer, until I'm a grandparent watching my grandchild's baby, you know, get sick, get cancer, because some Navy official in our time decided that our families were less important than their convenience, than getting another star in a costume, uh, than, their, than their pride. And I don't want to wait until all I can do is wish for a time machine. Mm -hmm. But the one piece of good news, I guess, is that we don't need a time machine to be here right now, where we still have a chance to mitigate the damage that has been done and to get the right experts in and the right emergency resources in place to prevent any more harm to our island, to our aquifer and to our people. And, and, and so I would, I think, you know, personally, I feel like it's all of our kuleana to, to, to take a stand, to use our time now in this generation to, to finally address this 80 year old menace that's been poisoning our, our, our aina, poisoning our, our water since, almost since it's, it was built in the first place. Um, and, and so, uh, again, thank you everyone for coming and learning more. Uh, there's an opportunity to, to learn even more about PFAS this Thursday and this Saturday. Uh, we will, you know, water protectors from uh, ac across the islands, from the continent, from Guahan, from other places. We're gonna we're gonna be marching from Kehi Lagoon starting at 1 p.m. Uh, to NAVFAC, which is the the Navy department in charge of the Red Hill facility. Um, and 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 that's just one opportunity. There'll be more coming up coming up in the future um and also to ring at the board of water supply um everyone who can go uh who can testify please do because again this is this is our, our generations this is the fight of our generation um and yeah and and so with that just again thank you so much everyone for um for your time and, and for all of the work that i know so many of you have been doing already um to engage with this campaign and 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 yeah and um, please have a good uh a good night and stay tuned stay tuned for more action no, thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. All right, it was, uh, I enjoyed it. Thank, thank you, Oren. Thank you. Mahalo. Hey, Hello. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Wayne. Mahalo and aloha.